Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me here tonight to speak to you about liquefaction. Uh, as has been already mentioned, um, this year we've had, well, we've had one very, very awful earthquake in Canterbury, not to mention what's happened across the sea Pacific in, in Japan. So before I start, I, I would just, with the, I'd just like us all to remember for a few moments those people um, who were killed in these, in these terrible disasters and those who were maimed and, and indeed those who have lost their livelihoods and their homes. So if, I don't, don't stand up, if you just remain seated and if we could just spend a few moments just to remember those people. Thank you very much. So let's move on to, to liquefaction. And I'm going to start off with a rant. Um, <laughs> I'm allowed to rant, I've been told. Um, first of all, um, I, it's amazing that I actually possess a radio at the moment because every time I hear somebody coming onto the radio and talking about liquefaction, they get it wrong. And it's about time that a, a soil mechanic, I'm a soil mechanic, talked about liquefaction and not a hard rock geologist. So that's, that's what I'm talking about. I'm, all, I'm having a second rant. Um, and that is, um, and, and we weren't allowed to you pr use props, but I have a prop. I'm drinking beer. Beer is the outward manifestation, indeed the result, of brewing. Liquefaction is what happens, it's a process. The silt and the sand and the water you find on the surface is the manifestation of that. So when people say, oh, there is liquefaction over there, it's wrong. They, they, what they're seeing is the manifestation of liquefaction having taken place under the ground, under the surface, in the ground. So um, as long as we get that right from the start, I can stop ranting and get on with some science. <laughs> Before we can understand the process of liquefaction, we have to understand some soil mechanics. Now, people from the States, sometimes called what I would call soil dirt, I think it rather demeans this wonderful material called soil, because soil is an intelligent material. It has a memory, it knows where it's been. Um, it, it's clever, it can be either plastic or elastic. It can be thixotropic. It's got all these wonderful properties. Um, it's not just dirt. And, it's got, and it has these properties which, which make it very unique as, as a material, a uh, construction material. Um, and, and, and what I want to talk a little bit about is the mechanics of this material, because if you understand the mechanics of soil, you can understand the process of liquefaction. So I'm going to start a long, long time ago. I'm going to start in 1776. I'm going to move quite quickly through the present day, I hasten to add. And in 1776, as, as, as again, um, people from the US will know, that's the start of the revolution. Oh, um, yeah, the, the rebels, as I would call them. Um, and <laughs> um, and the, start, the start of the, revo the revolution. And, but at that time, there, there was a, the, the first paper published in soil mechanics. And it was published by a gentleman who became very famous for doing other things. His name was Charles Augustin de Coulomb. The Coulomb, the unit of charge, is also named after him. Now, Coulomb was a military engineer by, by his original profession, and Coulomb had been sent out by the, by the French army to, the, uh, to Martinique in, um, um, in the Caribbean to build forts. He was, a, he was basically a military engineer who built forts. Um, and, so he had, and he spent about eight years in Martinique building a fort. He also caught yellow fever and things like that. But he spent most of his time building a fort. But I suspect it was a bit boring for a man with a the, with the, with the brain the size of a planet because he, he started thinking about what was happening. And what he found was he was building, um, he, he was building uh, uh, excavations in order that he could put a moat around, around his castles or forts. And he found that as he was building these, they kept on failing. Into, in, into the moat. The slopes kept on failing down into the moat. And so he thought about it and, and looked at some earlier work that had been done, and he came up with this concept of friction in soils. The fact that soils are a frictional material. Now, what do I mean by that? It means that if, like any if the concept of friction, that if you have two, two, two surfaces together, if there's not very much force acting between them, it's very easy for them to slide. If you increase the force between them, it's more difficult to slide. 
And he had the concept of soil as an assemblage of particles. And each of those particles is linked to, is t it's attached to the next one. And what happens is that it's the, it's the interparticulate forces which give that soil its strength. Anybody who's ever tried to put a fence post in the ground, or in my case, put a Christmas tree into a pot of sand, you, know, you will know that as you bash harder into the ground, it gets stronger and stronger. That's because if you go sit, going deeper down to the ground, the interparticulate forces increase as you go down with depth. So basically, you go down into the ground, there's more soil above acting, weighing down onto the particles, and so those particles have greater force acting between them, and consequently, the strength and stiffness of that soil is greater. That's why we dig down to put foundations in the ground, so we go down to a harder layer, a stiffer, a stronger layer, where the foundation will be able to be supported. That's why we put deep foundations, piles, into the ground, because we transfer the load of a building from the surface down to depth, where the strength and stiffness of the soil is greater. So it'll support a greater structure with less deformation. So there's this principle, this idea of friction in soils. Not an awful lot happened in soil mechanics for about 160 years, you'll be pleased to know. So we, so we can zap now right up forward to 1936. And we move from Martinique in the Caribbean to MIT, that's the one in Boston, and, and to Vienna, and the, and the University of Vienna, where a, one of the, a, a professor by the name of Karl Terzaki, who's often known as the father of soil mechanics, because he came up with a lot of the very early theories in soil mechanics and the concepts. Karl Terzaki was, was contemplating what happens to soil when it is submerged, when there's water in the soil. And he came up with this, what, this concept that we know as the principle of effective stress. Now, effective stress is the stress that acts between the, the two particles when you take into consideration any fluid pressure that's also acting in, in, in that medium of, of soil and water. So let's imagine a saturated soil. Let's imagine a saturated soil sitting, one, uh, maybe elements of that soil sitting one meter below the bottom of the sea with 100 meters of water above it. The strength of that soil, believe it or not, is the same as exactly the same soil sitting in the bottom of a pond at the same depth with only about a millimetre of water, or even zero millimetres of water at the top, as long as it's fully saturated. Because what we have is the strength of the soil is, a con is basically caused by this interparticulate force. So in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a case we've got a submerged soil, the soil particles will experience an upthrust. And so, it, depending on the, on the volume of water they, 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 dis they, they, they displace, it's all, all back to Archimedes, we've gone back a bit further now. Um, <laughs> but basically, they will put it up first. And so, the, so, they're, they're the, so the actually, the weight of soil particles acting down would be reduced. But the, the net effect of a, two soil particles is the, all, the, the, all the soil that's there plus the water. And the effective stress is that total stress, as we call it, the, the weight of the soil particles and the water above it, minus the weight of water above that location. So if you increase the depth of water, you don't actually change the, the net pressure, the effective stress, as we call it. So effective stress is the difference between the total stress, that all the stress is acting down, minus the pressure that's in the water acting between the soil grains. So we've talked about effective stress due to what we call a static water pressure. But you can also get pressures developing in the, in the water due to other causes, and we call those excess pore water pressures. The pressure of the water in the pore, pores between the soil grains, we call that pore pressure, and so it can be either hydrostatic, or it can be greater, or indeed less than hydrostatic, due to changes of the, of the pressure in that water. Let me give you an example. If I were to take a, a very high quality bicycle pump, and take it to a bucket of water, and fill it with water, and then turn it to Ray here and then press it, she would get very, very wet. If I put my thumb over the end rather than and started pressing it, what would happen? The pressure in that water will go up. And so, as, so we're not allowing it to change volume, so the pressure in the water goes up. If I take my thumb very slightly off the end and let, allow a little orifice at the end, then gradually, if I keep the same force on, that water will move and the a pressure, as I push, the pressure in that water will dissipate away as I push the water out of the bicycle pump. 
That's really the analogy of what happens in soils when you load them but don't allow them to change volume. What will happen is that water pressure will go up like the inside the wa water inside my bicycle pump. So that water pressure goes up, then the total stress hasn't changed, the, the pore pressure has gone up, total stress minus pore pressure, effective stress, therefore the effective stress goes down. That is the interparticulate contact stress decreases. The strength and stiffness of soil depends on that effective stress, not on the total stress. So if you go down the ground and you increase the pore pressure, you can actually get to a situation where you can reduce the interparticulate stress so much that it becomes very, very weak until eventually there is no interparticulate stress and the soil loses all its strength. If it loses all its strength, it can flow like a liquid. Oh, and that's what is, that's how we get what's called liquefaction, when the pore pressure is greater than the confining pressure holding it down.